Are you dreaming about building your own app? Or do you work in a small company? Then this video is for you. You can look at books like this and think that there is no way you can have or even need same engineering practices as big companies do, but you might be wrong there. In this video, we're going to look at three categories of engineering practices, the things that you should absolutely copy even if you're building an app with your friend things you can try to scale down and adjust to your situation and things you should avoid until your company is big enough to benefit from them hopefully by the end of this video you will not only get examples of uh, engineering practices in each category but you will also learn how to identify what you can use and what is better to postpone if there's only one thing you will get from this video, let it be this. Blameless culture. It is especially important for small companies. You probably rely a lot on trust between people, and this is the way to build this trust and respect. The core idea of the blameless culture is that you don't blame people, you learn from mistakes, and then you make sure that the mistakes are harder to make. For example, if you merge the broken code to production and the application doesn't work, the next step that you do is you add a testing step in your pipeline or if somebody says something wrong to your clients you provide the guidelines for the next time and the common response to the blameless culture is that does it encourage mistakes because people are not blamed for them anymore and the answer is no the action is still not desirable the mistake is still not desirable but we acknowledge that we're all humans we are prone to making mistakes and that's why we are building these automated processes to help us avoid as many mistakes as we can. The next item is CI/CD pipeline and we're continuing to build on this idea that humans make mistakes and you want everything to be on a conveyor belt in a pipeline or any other factory analogy that you can think of to avoid having to think about it. And okay, to be fair, how many times have you had the situation when you wrote your code, you ran all the tests, and then you made a tiny, tiny change that would absolutely not affect anything. And then you didn't run the test again. This is a situation that will not happen with the pipeline because the pipeline will not hesitate to run the test again. Even for one person, even for a small project, I would build a pipeline probably with just um, code verification and testing. But having a pipeline helps you to add steps to it later with GitHub Actions being free for your private repositories as, as a person, there is just no justification to not do it. Word of warning, do not spend too much time automating your pipeline. At least he's not eating the plant anymore. So your next actionable step for this principle is to go into your repository and set up a very, very simple pipeline. Or add a step with testing if you already have one. Next engineering principle is code review. And it may sound a bit silly for people working in bigger companies because for us it's more or less a given, but it's very common in smaller companies when one person is responsible for one area or even for one service and nobody else has any knowledge about this area. So basically code reviews are useless and not happening. But this is an approach that can go very wrong very quickly because remember that point about us being humans? Yes, I'm going to iterate on it over and over again because this is the thing that you have in common with big companies. You are both employing humans. This video is made in 2025. It's still a thing. <laughs> and even the smartest people in the company are just too close to their code. Even if you don't feel personally attached, you just spend a lot of time thinking about that problem and writing this code and you're just blind to the obvious mistakes in the code. It's just how brain works. What do you do when you don't have anybody to look at your code? There are three things you can possibly do. The first one is you go to sleep and then you look at your code next morning or maybe in a couple of days with fresh eyes. Second one, you use AI. Modern code review tools are not that bad. It's better than nothing. And a third option that you might want to use if it's a big feature and a lot of things are relying on it is to get a colleague with somewhat similar background explaining what are you doing, what are you trying to achieve and why is this important. Word of warning, it's a sanity check. It's not a nitpicking contest. Let me know if I need to add the video about how to review pull requests in a list. But in two words, be nice to each other. And your action item for this engineering principle is to either set up the AI reviewer for your 
pull requests or go to your repository settings and set your colleagues as default reviewers for the pull request so they are at least notified that there is something to review. And the last engineering principle in a category of things that you can copy from bigger companies is having documentation. It may seem like way too much when you're working on your project on your own and you don't want to waste time writing documentation. I completely understand it. But not only it leads to tribal knowledge when you try to hire more people and you have to explain it over and over again or rely on people who already work for you, but it can also be a problem for you personally because you may be building your pet project and then abandoning it because it's very normal Normal for pet projects and experiments and then you will go back in half a year you won't remember what you did there because well there is no documentation okay but what do you document the first thing would be to document the why's why are you doing what you're doing what are you trying to achieve what are the goals why are you making this decision and not this decision because you don't really need to document how your code works you can read the code the decision making process is not there it's it's completely lost as soon as the decision is made and forgotten the second thing you want to write is workarounds because not all of our solutions are optimal and we use workarounds quite often but trust me you're gonna forget them very very soon and the third thing is a bit tricky but you might want to think about it is to document the assumptions for example I'm building this app assuming that I will only have 100 users a day so I'm not really paying attention to performance this is very tricky because recognizing assumptions is difficult but if you can, write it down. Keep it very simple, very short, and very searchable. If you write the most perfect documentation, you place it in some folder and you forget where this folder is, it's not a very useful documentation. Obviously, your next action item is to go ahead and write down why you're building that project or why did you build the feature that you just built. And we are moving on to the second part, which can be a bit controversial because these are the things that you probably don't need, but you might might want to have it if you can make it work for your company. And we're going to start with one of the most controversial things I have, and this is postmortems. It sounds like the most corporate thing you can possibly imagine. But in reality, we're just building on the previous principles. We're taking the blameless culture and the documentation and mixing them together. If you Google a postmortem, you will see a very complicated structure of a document, and you probably don't need it at this stage. Instead, you only take two parts from it. The history, what happened and why, and the lessons. Here's what we're not gonna do in the future. If you accidentally wiped out your whole database, here's your postmortem. What happened? Somebody ran a delete statement without the where clause. It happens more often than you think. Why did it happen? Because of a bug, it was the only way to unblock the client by removing some of the records that were corrupted. And what do we learn from that? First, we made our production database read-only. Second, we raised the priority of building the admin tool that works with client data on production. And the third one, we added a test to our pipeline to make sure that the bug that caused corrupted data is not going to happen again. Postmortems will have the same word of warning as a documentation. You have to keep it short and searchable, but the short part is becoming more important because otherwise nobody's going to read them and you want people to read your postmortems. And an action item would be to think about the last oopsie that you had for your project and try to figure out why it happened and what do you need to change in your process. Next one is feature flags. As soon as you start building more and more features, some of the features will not be built quickly. You will need to have some foundational code that may be common for a few features. So you might want it in your main branch before the feature can actually be available for your end users. A lot of people start getting creative. Some start keeping their features in the branches and cherry picking the common elements, which leads to, of course, a lot of merge conflicts and slower development. Or they are just hoping that nobody will find their features. And the only thing that you really need to do is use feature flags. You can keep it as simple as some config parameter or maybe a query parameter, or maybe even a white list of users that have access to the feature. Keep it simple but writing your code with feature flags in mind can solve a lot of problems for you so just keep it as an option another principle is the one that we love in corporate it may or may not work for small companies no ticket no work i have to say it is amazing when all of your work can be traced by tickets because first of all you see how much you've done and this feeling of satisfaction is amazing second you can 
track how fast you're working or which things are taking more time than the other ones. You also have a backlog of things to do. So having tickets is amazing, but you might want to be very flexible with it as a small company. A lot of small fixes will take less time than creating a ticket for them. So what you can do instead is you can keep the tickets for the big features, something that really changes the behavior of your product. And all the small bugs, small features, everything that you add, just keep running list for it. It still gives you this feeling of satisfaction. You can still see what you've done. It takes way less bureaucracy to set it up. A great example of this for small projects would be GitHub projects or GitHub issues. And the last engineering principle or practice that you probably want, but you need to be very careful with is code style. Why would you even want to bother with code style? You will notice it as soon as you get another person on your project, because we all have our own personal preferences and they don't really matter, but you also don't want to have conversations in your pull requests about tabs or spaces or curly brackets. Automate everything you can out of it. Just use some kind of flinter text style that fixes those empty spaces for you. Trust me, you don't want to waste time or about it. Remember this trust issue from point one? There is no better way to erase trust and respect than arguing about empty lines and spaces. Make sure that it works for everyone the same, whether it's a linter inside your pipeline or it's some kind of settings for the IDE that you're using. Make sure that for every person in your company it produces the same result. And now the most controversial, the most interesting and the most juicy part of this video, the things you should absolutely avoid. Number one, microservices. There are very few reasons to use microservices for your new project. If you're going to say, yeah, but what are the reasons? You probably don't want to do it. Even if you're working on the app that works with some personal data and you want to keep it separate, keep it as a module and extract it as soon as you go live, as soon as it's, you know, economically justifiable. Don't do it from the very beginning. Modular monolith not microservices. The second thing, if you're still watching the video, is over-engineering infrastructure. And I know you've just learned Kubernetes. You really want to use it and you have good arguments. You have your app and you want to be able to scale it to millions of users. But the time that you're going to spend setting up and managing your infrastructure will just not be justifiable in any terms for your small app. And even if you set up your infrastructure, chances are, as soon as it goes viral, you will have to change everything about it. The third thing is probably something that a lot of people will agree. You don't need formal meetings as a small company. It can be very tempting to have planning because we need to arrange our work for the future. And the only thing that you really need from all of these meetings is to be on the same page. So talk to each other, just talk to each other. And if you do add some of the meetings, because Sometimes maybe formal schedule plannings is a good thing to keep us afloat. Reevaluate them constantly. After each meeting, think about it. Was it useful? Maybe we should do it differently. Maybe we just don't do it anymore. And the last part is too many tech stacks. We've all heard so many times there are no bad tools. Every tool is good for the purpose. It does not mean that you need to have a whole toolbox for your variety of purposes. You choose the language that you know better and you try to make it work. If it doesn't work, you choose something else. Big companies can afford software engineers who can work in multiple languages because they can afford this learning time and they probably have specialists in these languages that can help. So use what you have expertise on yours or somebody else's in the company. And remember that if you have multiple people working in your company, but each one is responsible for their own piece and their own tech stack, your bus factor is still horribly low. Okay. That was a part of the video that was well researched based on something that very smart people wrote books about and based on my own experience in the industry. But now I want to add a few points that I think are not very good for small companies. Uh, but speaking as an engineer, I would want to have any way. The first one is logging and observability. I'm working on a separate video about error handling, but in two words, if something is broken. I want to know when, where, and how. So I need logs, traces, and metrics. It's not an easy or cheap thing for a small company. So I cannot really put it on my list, but I want it. As an engineer, I want it. The second thing is something that you might want as a business owner. And this is the usage data. Again, this is something that's kind of difficult to collect because you are basically working with analytic events and you cannot afford a data warehouse 
as, as a small company, but maybe you can find a way to figure out what do your users like, what do they use, what they don't use, so you can shape your business strategy. Maybe you can just make surveys. And the third part is kind of vital for the tech-based business to kind of persevere is to have a connection between the code and the business. If you have different people responsible for requirements and the code, then make sure that you're using the same terms, that you can explain the flows in the code to the non-technical people. But that's just a list of wishes. So that was it for today. Subscribe to the channel to not miss the next video and I'll be happy to see you there. Bye guys!